Good evening, everyone, and welcome to From Development to Production at Scale with Docker and Microservices. My name is Adele, and I head up the community team here at eSynergy Solutions. We specialize in open source and cloud resourcing. If you are looking for a new opportunity, we can help you find the right role tailored to your skills and experience on either a contract or permanent basis. So if you are looking, please do send over your updated CV. Should you be looking to build out a team, we can help you with hiring and attracting top talent. Alongside this, we can also help you with upskilling your employees around the latest open source and cloud technologies. Now moving on to some housekeeping. If you have any questions for Jerome, please fire them over via the questions box throughout and Jerome will answer them at the end of his talk. We are recording the session and the slides and recording will be made available and sent to you tomorrow by email along with my contact details. So now I'm gonna pass over to Jerome who will begin the talk. Hi everybody, so I do hope that everybody can uh, see my slides here. Um, maybe if I can get a confirmation from Adele or something that the slides are ending showing up. Yes, all good. Okay. Apparently, so far, so good. All right, so from development to production at scale with Docker and microservices. So first, a short introduction. So I'm Jerome Petazzoni, and uh, as you probably guessed from the accent, I'm French. Nobody's perfect. But I've been living in California for the last five years when I joined a company who was back then called DotCloud. And eventually, DotCloud became Docker, and Docker became um, much more well known than was um, dot cloud back then but before docker was docker um, dot cloud was a platform as a service company and we were using uh, something called zero pc which is uh, which is an rpc layer using zero mq and message pack but also containers uh, dot cloud was making extremely extensive use of containers so linux containers using lxc uh, copy and write storage systems with aufs and a security layer based on GRSEC. And at the peak of its activity, uh, Dot Cloud has about like 100,000 containers running in production for various customers. So that, that's how Docker was born. At some point, we made what we call a pivot in startup speech, which means that we say, OK, we want to make this big refactoring of our container engine. And we want this refactoring, this new version of the container engine to be open source. And we will call it Docker. And, and then we released that. And there was a lot of interest for it, which was completely unexpected. Uh, and eventually, we decided to concentrate exclusively on the development of Docker and to give up on this .cloud things because it was a nice project and it was working and bringing revenue, but much less than what Docker was uh, about to, to yield later. So that's the, the kind of really short story of uh, Docker and, and, and its roots in the .cloud. So our plan for today, now that the intros are behind us, so first I will um, talk about microservices. What, what are microservices? And I will talk about their challenges. What's difficult when we do microservices? And then I will explain how Docker can help us uh, to overcome those challenges and then explain how to achieve this today by uh, adding some demos to that. So first, what are microservices? So microservices are a style of software architecture. So it's a way to develop software, uh, particularly big software. Um, and the core idea of microservices is to break down a big application into many small services, each doing a small and tiny thing uh, that can be run independently. For instance, if you have a big e-commerce website like uh, Amazon, then you can break it down into a web front end but that web front end, uh, each time that it will need to display products or log in a user or dispatch an order, then it will 
tap into those microservices over APIs. And so you can have uh, something, a, a service that has the catalog of the products. So it might have the list of products, the references, descriptions, and things like that, but no information about pricing or availability. And then you can have separate services for that, like a separate service uh, to deal with inventory and availability another with pricing depending on the geographic regions, another to compute shipping costs and so on and so forth. Um, you can have a payment processor to deal with payments, whether it's by credit card or any other means. Uh, we can have a separate service to generate um, invoices. You can have a search engine, a recommendation engine, a completely different system to deal with the user. So all those things will be like small independent applications. So why would someone would want to do that? The idea is that you can use different stacks for all those services. You can pick the best tool, the best programming language, the best framework. So for instance, maybe you want to pick Java for the web frontend, but you want to have some of those backend services written in Python or Ruby. Um, or maybe at some point you have something real time and it's using Node.js or Golang and so on and so forth. So this also lets you uh, replace or refactor the services independently. If at some point you say, okay, now we are going international and so we have to change our uh, shipping microservice, the thing that computes shipping costs, uh, we're doing a huge rewrite because before we were only shipping uh, in one country and now we're shipping worldwide and so it's a completely different thing. So we were doing a huge rewrite. Then as long as the new service has the same API, as the same interface with the rest of the system, uh, you're fine. And you can afford to run both services side by side to do tests and uh, compliance checking and things like that before doing the big jump uh, to go to the new service. It also means that you need less coordination when you deploy a new version. When you have a traditional monolithic application, it's one giant code base that you deploy on your server or your servers. Um, and when you roll out a new release, uh, you, you're taking all the code at once. So maybe you want to ship that new, well, shipping uh, pricing uh, calculator, but at the same time, all the little changes that have been done by the other teams are going to be deployed as well because it's one big code base. So by breaking things down in, in microservices, you can avoid that and only deploy one service without touching the rest of the platform, which makes deployment uh, less risky, which means that instead of being scared about, okay, we're going to deploy and maybe things will break, we're not sure. Each time that you deploy, there is this kind of uh, uh, angst and worry that something might go wrong. Well, with microservices, the idea is that by deploying only a small part of the time, you reduce the risk, which means that when you want to deploy, to fix a bug or to uh, roll out a new feature, uh, there, there is much less, um, possibility of breakage and so you can deploy more often. It, it's, uh, it, it allows to be more innovative and, and faster to bring uh, features to production. So there are also organizational uh, aspects. If you have many small services instead of one big application, then you you can have uh, many small teams instead of one big army of developers. Um, Jeff Bezos of Amazon says that he, he wants ideally teams to be small enough that they can be fed with two pizzas, which depending on the size of the pizza and the size of the developer means between maybe four, five, six, seven developers. Uh, smaller teams have less communication overhead. Uh, when, when you have a big team, uh, you have to wait until everybody is here when you do a meeting. Uh, then quite often somebody will not be there or will be late and you will be waiting. If you have smaller teams, meetings can be more efficient. It's easier to have everybody being aware of everything that's going on. So you can have this kind of uh, the upside of the startup, which is this small agile team uh, within a bigger organization. It also enables a better ownership of services. Ownership here means being both responsible and empowered about a service. It means that if, if within your big application there is one specific service 
Um, and there is the team that, that is developing that service that says, hey, we really think that we shouldn't use Java or Python or whatever there. We think we should use that other language. Instead of having to fight against uh, everybody else in the company who thinks differently, it's their service, it's their thing, and they can do whatever they want, so they are empowered, but they are also responsible, which means that this small service is a small application, they are responsible for the uptime of this, so you're giving them a pager, so now when this little uh, component breaks, they are the ones to uh, wake up and, and fix it. Um, so that, that gives a better, um, uh, a better sense of responsibility than when you are just responsible for a library in something bigger, and then if it breaks, it's really hard to say who's responsible, and also conversely, it's really hard to convince everybody else to uh, use a different language or framework because of one little part of the program. So now, that being said, um, microservices are don't have only upsides, they also have downsides, and we will uh, review some of them, so the challenges associated with microservices. So we need a, a bunch of things if we want to implement microservices efficiently. First, we need a way to do fast, efficient RPC calls. So a way so that uh, one of the, the services can call other services uh, really efficiently, uh, if possible, almost as efficiently as a local call. So unfortunately, Docker will not help with that part. There are many things that can be done here. Uh, we can use like REST APIs. Uh, we, there is like a list of technologies here, like Dnode, uh, SOAP, XML RPC, uh, Captain Proto, which is more recent, uh, Zero RPC, the thing that we developed at Dot Cloud and, and for why uh, that we considered as being kind of our secret weapon, uh, because it would let us code a microservice in a few hours and plug it into our infrastructure. And so rolling out new features or even replacing existing things uh, could be done extremely efficiently, very, very quickly. So there are some ways to, uh, to, to, to achieve fast, efficient RPC calls, but Docker doesn't help with that. Another thing that you need to do is to actually break down your big application into small microservices. And this is like kind of a design and architecture challenge. Uh, and Docker will not help with that neither, in the sense that Docker will not stand up and walk to the whiteboard and draft your architecture. So you, to break down a big application in small parts, there are a few things that can help. Uh, for instance, you can pretend that you are outsourcing some parts of your stack to another team or company somewhere else, and they will have to ship you this component, and you will uh, call this component over APIs. If you pretend that, which is kind of what happens, except instead of being outsourcing, it's just delegated to a team in the company, you're putting in place the, the right kind of communication, but of, okay, you're going to ship this internal search engine or this uh, billing system, this is the API that we want, and now you are free to make the right decisions um, to, to make that happen. Another thing that helps when designing uh, the application, in, when dealing with uh, data access, is to wrap the database access uh, around services such, uh, so that you have for each table, for each object, you have one service. So if in your database, you had customers, um, articles, uh, you have uh, invoices. Well, each of those tables can correspond to one service. It's a good starting point when architecturing something uh, uh, in microservices. Now, you also need an efficient deployment system because um, the big application that you use to deploy maybe once a week, and that's if you're uh, pretty agile, is now uh, broken down in many smaller services that you want to deploy sometimes every day and sometimes even more often than that. So your deployment system must be really, really efficient. If the deployment system involves uh, 10 steps that have been done manually uh, with multiple ops persons watching over each other to make sure nobody makes a mistake, then um, 
microservices will be complicated because you will spend your time uh, deploying. So you need something efficient to deploy so that you kind of literally just press a button and the code then automatically goes all the way to production. And Docker does help with that. We also need efficient network plumbing because when you have a monolithic application, you don't need much network plumbing. Generally, the network plumbing will be uh, the code is connecting to the database and we are accepting traffic from the public internet. And that's pretty much it. So when we scale, we add a load balancer, but that's pretty much it. Uh, now, uh, with microservices, you have tons of uh, smaller services running on multiple machines. They have to connect to each other. They have to discover each other. Um, you will have much more load balancing, resiliency, and things like that uh, happening. Um, and so, the specifically, load balancing, even if load balancing is not specific to microservices, of, of course, um, big web applications do load balancing already, but with microservices, load balancing becomes mandatory very early, so it's something that has been uh, thought of in the early stage of the project. Docker does help with that as well as we will see. So there are a few other uh, challenges associated with microservices. Uh, the main thing is that uh, microservices turn your application into a distributed system, and distributed systems are hard. So there are a couple of further readings about that. There is an article called Microservices Not Free Lunch, uh, which kind of depicts um, more of those challenges. But that article is very interesting because it's written by someone uh, who is more like a microservices advocate. So it's more like, hey, I like microservices, but I found those problems, and I want you to adopt microservices, but I want you to not have those problems. So this is this is the kind of uh, of things that can happen if you do microservices. And another thing, if you think that distributed systems are easy, I highly recommend to read the Call Me Maybe blog post series uh, written by Guy Kingsbury about uh, it's it's a series of uh, of blog posts um, trying. Uh, distributed systems like replicated databases, um, consensus systems, and simulating network partitions and showing what happens when you have network partitions. And spoiler alert, it's often not very pretty. Um, all right, so now how does Docker help us uh, to implement microservices? Because I mentioned a few items where Docker could help us uh, about deployment specifically and all those network things. So let's see that. So let's see how we uh, build code in a kind of, let's say, pre-Docker era. Um, there are um, at least two schools of thought. Uh, you can have deployment scripts or you can have configuration management. There is also, you can do everything manually, but for the sake of our sanity, we assume that we don't do deployment entirely manually because that, that just doesn't work in the long run. So uh, if you use deployment scripts, uh, that's rather nice because it's easy to write. You, uh, the, the steps uh, to get to a nice deployment script are rather easy. You say, okay, write down the instructions on this like paper notepad and then we will turn those instructions into a shell script, and then we will refine this shell script, and little by little you get some automation. That's nice, but um, there, there are some downsides with that. When you execute a deployment script, it relies on the initial state of the system. If your deployment script uh, say, okay, and now install libraries and packages A, B, C, D, um, and then at the end, okay, that, that works, that's great. Um, however, now if you run that on a different system, uh, maybe you don't have exactly the same uh, package management mechanism. So for instance, a deployment script that has been written for a Debian server will not work on a Fedora server, so you need to take that into account. Maybe when you tested your deployment script, you already had some base libraries installed, and so your script doesn't install them. But then when you go deploy on another machine, that other machine does not have those base libraries installed, and so your deployment script will ultimately fail because it doesn't account for that, which leads people to use configuration management, where you have 
mechanisms that describe the state that you want to achieve on your machines, and then those um, the cooperation management system will make converge this state, uh, the server to this state. So cooperation systems are uh, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salt. Uh, they tend to be more reliable, uh, more powerful than simple deployment scripts, but they are also harder to uh, to master. The learning curve can be steeper, and very often when you say to uh, a developer, okay, so to deploy now you have to edit the Chef cookbook to add the new packages and config files that you've written. Um, for many developers, that will not be a pleasant experience. So um, the problem that we are facing is that uh, we have different environments. Uh, we have, for instance, my uh, development computer might not be exactly the same as my coworkers. A computer and our computers are both different from the production servers and we need something to solve that. With Docker we address this um, by combining the advantage of both uh, scripts and config management systems. Uh, scripts because with Docker when you want to build a component you write a Docker file. So a Docker file is a recipe uh, to build a container image. And a Docker file will look a lot like a shell script. It will be a list of instructions that have to be uh, executed. But the, the key difference is that the Docker file also specifies the initial state. The Docker file says, start with a Ubuntu 14.04 image, or start with a Fedora 21 image, or start with CentOS 6.5, and so on and so on. So by defining the initial state, you know exactly what will happen later. Instead of being, hmm, I don't know if my script will work on another distribution, you don't have to worry about it because you define the initial state. So you know that you only will have to run on this specific distribution. Moreover, the builds will be uh, fast thanks to a caching system, which, which is a little bit like if, for those of you who have built C code, I don't know. I know that not many people do that anymore. But uh, there is the, this makefile system that is smart enough to only rebuild uh, the source files that have been changed. Um, the Docker file will have something a little bit similar in the sense that when you change the recipe uh, used to build a container, uh, the steps that have not changed will not be executed again. And I will show a little demo of that. Um, so. I'm connected here uh, on a remote EC2 instance, uh, and um, I will uh, get a little sample application uh, to show you how we build containers. So, and by the way, all the code uh, that I'm using here is publicly available on GitHub, so you can repeat those experiments super easy. All right, so I have um, a little application here, and. Um, uh, in, in, in the www directory, I have one of those Docker files. So the Docker file says from Python. So Python here, it's it's a base image uh, that comes with Python pre-installed. So it's, we want to do Python instead of starting with let's say uh, the Fedora or CentOS or Debian or Ubuntu image. You can start directly from a Python image. Then I execute a few pip install commands to, to add packages. I add the code of my application inside the container. Then I define the command that should be used uh, to bring up the application. And then I say, oh, and by the way, this container will expose uh, a service on TCP port 5000 because here uh, my application server will be listing on port 5000. All right, so now we will build this. So we do docker build uh, dash t, so I'm going to give a name, so tw app v1. Uh, and when I do that build, all the build steps will be executed. So here it's running each command of the docker file, and after each command, it's taking a snapshot of the result. This means that if I run the build again, this time it will be almost instantaneous because it can, it can zoom through all those steps because they already exist. All right, so now I will execute that container, all right, and 
now that it's running, I will connect to it. All right, so I have to put together the IP address of my machine plus the port number. Right. And then in my browser, I will connect to the application that I just brought up. And then, surprise, oh, it says we have an error because it can't connect to the Redis data store. That's expected. That's because this is a web app that uh, relies on um, a front end and a back end. And here I just started the front end. So I need to start the back end. That's this Redis thing here. All right. So that uh, we will show that in a few minutes. Uh, what, so what about service dependencies? How would I deal with that? Like if I were in a again like pre Docker era, like I um, I have some coworker that gave me that code, I'm running the code, and it says, okay, I need Redis or I need MongoDB or MySQL or something like that. Um, so normally, if I'm on Linux, I would typically install packages using apt or U. If I am on OS X. I could use something like Broom or do some manual install or very often end up falling back on the Linux VM. If I'm on Windows, I have no idea because I haven't done development on Windows for almost a decade, but I hear that it's now pretty similar to the Mac situation. Um, and so some, some services would be pretty easy. Like in that scenario for Redis, uh, if I were on Linux, I would just do apt-get install Redis. On a Mac, I would do brew install Redis on Windows, I would do something and I would get Redis up and running. Uh, so that's fairly easy. But some services will be more complicated. Like what about Hadoop, Cassandra, Mesos? Then there are much more things to, to install and set up. And I could have conflicts between projects. What if I have multiple projects that I'm working on and they require Redis? And so I end up having multiple applications using the same Redis server to put their data. So in the Docker age, uh, if I need an extra service, I can run it in a container super easily and I can prefetch, I can, sorry, I can fetch a pre-built image from the Docker Hub. So the Docker Hub is a library, a publicly available library of container images. It has hundreds of official images, like there is a Redis image that is kind of a, approved by the Redis maintainers, and there are hundreds of thousands of community images uh, if you need some weird stuff for which there is no official image yet. So here, say, okay, I want to fix this application. This application is Redis, so I will, I will give it Redis, that's fine. Uh, so first, I go again, Docker run Redis. So I'm just starting the Redis service. I did it, that's it. So now, that's Redis, uh, and uh, now I will change the code of the application to use that. Uh, so I will edit uh, the code here, and here I have the part that connects to Redis, okay, and let's change that. And after making my change, I will build again. So this time I will call that TW app version two. All right, now I will run it again. Run TW app version two. Then I will check, okay, on which port is it running? 32777, All right? And here, I will go to 32777. And now the app works, so it's a very simple app. It just like uh, each time um, I uh, load the app, it tells me how many requests have been served. And if I had multiple um, backends, multiple servers, it would give me a list of all the, the servers and how many requests have served so far. So it's like the most basic distributed application ever. And there is something pretty interesting here, uh, is that I can do easy rollbacks. and um, so oh, I will talk about that in a minute. So now, um, what if I want to ship that code? So if I want to run this application on another machine, on another server. So again, 
before Docker, like the, the idea was, um, well, we can push that code to servers, so I can copy that code, like when I did git clone to get that, that code repository, I can repeat that on other machines, um, or better, we can push up, build artifacts, so I can build that into some kind of archive and deploy that um, on, on my servers. So I can use distribution packages, like dev or RPM packages, those are great, but they are kind of hard to build because they are a little bit too generic. Uh, so if you if you are just like a normal uh, Java, Ruby, Python, uh, Node, Go developer, generally building a, a dev or RPM package is not a super nice experience. Um, or you have some language specific packaging systems. If you're doing Python, um, uh, you can, you, you uh, you, you can build X or Will packages and then use pip to deploy. If you're using Ruby, it's gems. With Node.js, there is NPM and so on and so forth. So in, in that case, it's a little bit easier because it's generally designed by developers, for developers, but it's specific to a language. So if your application has bits in Ruby and bits in Python, you need to use different packaging systems. And the thing is that when a deployment fails, rollback isn't guaranteed to work. So this means that if you deploy a new version and something goes wrong and you're like, oh crap, we need to roll back, uh, then um, you don't know if that will work because you made changes to a service and now you need to revert those changes and there is no guarantee that you can revert them. I mean, normally all you have to do is just change the code back to the previous version. But what if you were generating um, style sheets with something like SAS? What if there are some extra steps that are not captured by the state of the code? Then rollback can fail. So with containers, the idea is that we the container images that we've built, uh, this TW app v1 and TW app v2, we can push them to registries. That very same registry from which we got the Redis image, we can put our images there and then other machines will be able to pull from them. So um, Docker Inc. provides a really simple and free registry that anybody can use so that when you want something like to immediately deploy code without thinking about more things to do, it, it works super fast. And I will show that now. So uh, what I will do is that I will do Docker tag uh, so my TW app v2 to jpdazo TW app v2. So jpdazo here is my um, login on the Docker Hub. Um, and now I will do Docker push uh, jpdazo TW app v2. And now it's going to push um, the, the application that I've built uh, to the Docker Hub. And so what is doing that, I will connect to another uh, machine. Um, uh, all right. So that's another machine. And, uh, and <clears throat> we have to wait until the push is over. It will take a couple of minutes. Um, so that will give me some time to talk a bit about the registry. So the code of the registry is open source. So if you want to run your own registry like on-prem, uh, if you don't want to use the, the Docker Hub, then you can do Docker run registry and it will pull uh, the uh, image of the registry server from the public Docker Hub and you can run it locally. By default, it will store the container images on plain files, but it can also be set up very easily to store on S3, Swift, if you're using OpenStack, on the Azure and Google Block Stores, on Ceph, or, and even on the Alien storage system. Um, so you can operate very easily your ARM registry on-prem. You can use the Docker Hub, as I mentioned, so that's a, uh, it's a cloud-based registry that is a little bit like the open source one, it's using the same code base, except it adds layers of authentication, access control, automated builds. So for instance, when you push your code to GitHub, uh, it can trigger a webhook that will automatically build that code and make the resulting image available on the hub. Um, 
And last but not least, there is also a commercial offering uh, called the Docker Trusted Registry, uh, or DTR in short, which is um, like the, the same thing as a Docker Hub, but available on-prem. So if you want all the niceness and goodness of the Docker Hub, but you want that on your servers and not on Docker in uh, cloud, then uh, you can get that too. All right, so let's look back at our push here. So the push is done. And you can see here it said image successfully pushed and then a bunch of image already exists. That's because uh, this app is based on the Python image and the Python image already exists in the Docker Hub. So when I did a push here, I pushed parts of the image that were specific to my application. So the, the like seven parts that we see here and a bunch of parts that are just part of the Python image and that could be skipped in the transfer. All right, so now I can go to my other machine and I can do um, Docker run. <coughs> uh, jp.zo slash tw app column v2. So it will say, okay, I don't have that locally, so it's going to download it from the Docker Hub. And this will be much faster, so we can watch it go. And then, once it's running, we shall connect to it. Right. Prepare the IP address of the machine. All right. So now it's running on that port. Fine. So I can take this, go to my web browser, and open it. And I see like this same application. Uh, but now I'm using a different backend. So you can see here, this request was served by 85 something something. This is the ID of the container here. You can see here like 854 and so on and so on. So the, the app tells me this server has served 10 requests so far over a total of that much. And you can see it's highlighted. So, um, so now I have this kind of really simple distributed application is actually running on multiple servers. And if I reload the first one, yeah. All right, so that's how I can really easily like move my code around. And now I will stop that extra content. So something really interesting is that um, the old version of my app, the one that didn't have the Redis connection information, it's still running. If I want here, I can go back to the old port and I still have this old version, the one that doesn't have the Redis connection information. So that means I can do rollback super easy because here I did, I mean, I made changes in the code, but I did not make um, changes in the deployed application. I built a package, deployed that package, and then I built a new package, deployed that new package, and the old one is still around. So if I need to roll back, uh, I can uh, do it very easily. Right. So now what about network plumbing? Because I say to you, okay, now we have a distributed application, we have to do load balancing, server discovery, those things are hard. How will Docker help us? So before, before when you wanted to do service discovery, you typically had to change your application code. You had, for instance, to um, look up the address of uh, your database and other services into a configuration database like console, etcd, zookeeper. You had to do some failover, like for instance, here I'm connecting to a Redis data store. But how do I deal with failover? Like if I, if this, how can you achieve high availability? The short answer is that I need replication, and when the primary fails, I need to switch to the secondary, which has a, a, an up-to-date copy of the data, and so my application needs uh, to kind of be aware of that, and I need to update my code to change the host and port they connect to, or I need to connect to a, um, an extra tier, middleware, or something that will do that for me. So I connect to my 
middle thing, and the middle thing connects to the primary database, and when the database fails, it connects to uh, the secondary, for instance. So the, the problem with that is that uh, my development stack becomes either very complex because I'm adding this middle tier because instead of just having my Redis, now I have the primary and secondary because in my development machine I want to simulate for those problems to make sure that the application will do well if those, if those things happen. Or my development stack will become very different from production because I will decide, well, you know what, I just need my Redis thing in dev. I don't want to simulate all this complicated primary and secondary and the load balancer and the switching logic. No, I'm just a developer here. And in that case, I have different setups in dev and prod. And so, well, once in a while, when there is this failover thing, um, I haven't tested it in dev, and I haven't tested it in dev. So I hope everything will be fine, but I have no ways to be sure until it happens. So with Docker, uh, the core idea is that we say, okay, developers, we heard you. You don't want to deal with the network plumbing because that's not your job. So what you will do instead is that the application code will connect to um, the uh, services using simple DNS aliases. And then we will inject those DNS aliases into the containers. So what does this mean? And here I think a small demo will be uh, way simpler. Uh, so I'm going to go back to my primary machine here, and I will show you what we mean with those DNS aliases. So remember um, when I uh, when I edited the code here, I changed here that was like Redis equal here instead of having the IP address, I just had Redis like this, and how could that even work? Well, it works um, by using this mechanism. So let, let's look at this. I'm going to start a small container. Uh, so I'm now in a little container, and I do ping Redis, and obviously it tells me that Redis is not a valid address. Fine. Now, what if I do the same thing, the same thing, except I'm adding what we call a link, and so I take my Redis uh, container ID, this 6AB something, and I say, okay, that will be Redis in this container. And now here, if I do ping Redis, it works. Because I've told Docker, I want Redis to point to this other container. And so what Docker did is to add a DNS entry, and to be real, it's just a line in ETC hosts, uh, mapping Redis um, to uh, the IP address of that container. So now I can even like connect to this Redis service, I can do a few Redis commands, um, set some key value. So these things let us decouple uh, the network plumbing from the application itself. Um, so, in dev, it means that Redis will be a Redis container. So, as a developer, I have a simple scenario. And when I go to production, then this Redis thing, this name, instead of pointing directly to the Redis service, it can point to um, a, a load balancer, a redirect, or a specialized container that will deal with the uh, specifics of, of my production setup. We call those containers ambassadors because, I mean, they are not technically exactly doing load balancing because sometimes they do load balancing with only one backend. Sometimes they do discovery, sometimes not. Sometimes they deal with failover, sometimes not. So we decided to give them this generic type of ambassador. So now how can we do this today? So what, what does it look like if today I want to take a kind of real application and deploy that with Docker. So when we work on a single node, so when I'm in dev or when I'm staging up something for QA, um, there is a tool called Docker Compose, which is the equivalent of a Docker file, but for a full application stack. A Docker file lets me describe what single container. A Docker Compose file lets me describe a stack of containers. And then, with a single command, I can bring that stack up and running super easily. 
and I have some really easy developer workflow. So I will show exactly how this works. So uh, I'm going to do git clone, uh, jpeg and so docker coins. So this is a sample application, uh, and uh, without even knowing like what's in it and how it works and everything, uh, I will look at the Compose YAML file here uh, and say, okay, I have multiple sections corresponding to the services. So I have a RNG service, I have a hasher service, I have a web UI service, I have a Redis service, and I have a worker service. And all I have to do is Docker Compose up. And when I do Docker Compose up, it will build all those things. So here it's building uh, the RNG service and it's Python. Then it's building the Hasher service, which is Ruby. So th this is an application that we use during the, the workshops about Docker orchestration and microservices uh, because it has components in maybe not all, but many different languages to kind of point out that microservices, if you're so inclined, you can use different languages and frameworks uh, for different tasks. Now there is a Node.js component. Uh, and and now the app is up and running. So I can go to my web browser here and it's running on port 8000. And so this is a little web interface that shows me the, the performance of my app. So we use that app because when we will scale it, we will be able to see that performance graph uh, increase and go up as we add more containers to, to, the, to the pool. All right, um, so, and, and here you can see that I have um, the logs of all my containers being aggregated. So as a developer, it's also a good convenience. Um, all right, and so now, what if I want to go farther? Uh, what if I want to scale that? Uh, so I, Compose has some basic scaling primitives. So for instance, here I'm going to start my app and then I'm going to do Docker Compose, scale Walker to four. And it's going to create extra copies of this Walker container. And so here I see like I see a dip when I stop my application. And then when I started it with those four walkers, I see that I have higher performance. So scaling simple services, background workers, is super easy because it's just creating copies of existing containers. However, if we want to do uh, to, to scale like a web service, that will be a little bit different because we will need to add uh, a load balancer. We need service discovery. We need those extra things. All right. So how do we achieve that on multiple hosts? Then we add something called Docker Swarm. So Docker Swarm is Docker's native uh, clustering system. The concept of Swarm is that it takes multiple Docker machines and it makes them appear as one big single Docker machine. It's a little bit like a load balancer for the Docker API, if you will, in the sense that uh, before when I wanted to start containers, I would do Docker run this, Docker run that, with Swarm, when I do Docker run this and Docker run that, um, instead of parking directly to my Docker engine, I talk to Swarm, and Swarm will do uh, resource scheduling, so it will pick the exact machine on which the container should be started, uh, and it will dispatch the containers around. So um, the Swarm is in release candidate uh, since now like just a week. So it means that in a few days or weeks, you can expect to see uh, the first stable release out there. Um, and so this is a pretty big change because if I had done that presentation two weeks ago, I would have told you Swarm is currently in version 0 0.4 or 0 0.5, and it's still pretty bleeding edge and blah, blah, blah. Um, but we have achieved like a, a a new level of stability and we have come kind of past the milestones that we had decided to be confident in putting Swarm out there for production workloads. And so in, in a matter of uh, weeks, if not days, we will have Swarm 1.0 uh, out of the door. 
So what does it look like to use something like Swarm? So here, um, I'm going to uh, okay, first do some cleanup, so docker compose kill, docker compose rm -f. Um, so when I deploy with Swarm, uh, the mechanism will be a little bit more complex because uh, Swarm will not do a build from me here. In my compose file, I have like build sections. I have to replace that with image sections. So I'm going to use a little script that will uh, build uh, all those containers for me and then that will push them to the Docker Hub so that I can tell to Swarm, uh, use those images from the Docker Hub. That seems a little bit abstract, so I will just do it and we'll see what happens. So here, it has built all the containers, which took just like maybe one second or something because, again, the caching system kicked in and say, okay, you already built that before, so um, I can reuse the cached version. And now it's pushing um, uh, all those images to the Docker Hub, which means, by the way, that at any point in the future, I want to deploy again that same version, I can because it will stay forever on the Docker Hub, well, forever or until I explicitly delete it. And so it gives me a new compose file. So let's see what it's all about. In this new compose file, instead of having build lines, I have image lines. So this compose file refers to one exact specific version of my application hosted on the uh, Docker Hub. Now I'm going to replace all the connections between services by those famous ambassadors I was talking about earlier. So I have a little script here that does that. And now basically here, for instance, um, if I look at the web UI service that needs to connect to uh, the Redis data store, now it says, well, if you want to connect to Redis, you should, in fact, connect to 127.127.02. So this is an internal address that has been allocated for my Redis data store. And so now what I will do is that I will um, point to my uh, Swarm cluster. So I, this little command here is basically to say to my uh, Docker command line, OK, now talk to the Swarm cluster. And for instance, if I do Docker info now, I will see here that I have uh, five nodes in, in, in the, the demo cluster. One, two, three, four, and five. Okay, and now I'm going to bring up the application, so the Docker Compose app. So it will uh, pull the images that I've just built from the Docker Hub, so that will take uh, uh, a little bit of time because those images are still pretty big. Um, and, and then it will start them. What you can see here is that uh, it's pulling the images on all nodes. I, all nodes will not necessarily run all the things, but those images will be ready so that even if, let's say, like this hasher service, even if I want to run only two copies of it, and it means that two nodes will be uh, needing the image, but all nodes pull the image anyway, so that if, if later I need to scale, I can do it faster. All right, almost there. And so once now the, the containers are started, so now my application is running, but it's in a kind of broken, disconnected state. Imagine that you, you, you put up the servers, but you haven't connected the cables between them yet. That's the kind of idea here. So we have a couple of extra scripts uh, to deal with that. First, I will create those ambassadors. So I'm creating uh, all those extra containers um, that will act as load balancers and service school mechanisms. And then I'm injecting the configuration into those ambassadors. All the scripts that I'm using here are also available publicly on, on the address that you will see at, at the end of the presentation. So you can very easily um, uh, leverage on them if you want to build your thing. Okay, so now I want to um, connect to the application. So this gives me the address of the web UI. Uh,
Yeah, so the, the, the old one is now stopped. This is not talking to anything anymore, so I can discard it. But this is the new one. All right. And now I want to scale that. Okay, so I'm going to do auto compose scale. I'm going to say, okay, give me four walkers and um, also three ashers and also uh, two UIs. So I do that. It's creating a new series. You can see that was really fast because all of the images are already pulled on my cluster. And now I do create ambassadors once again. It will only create the missing ones. And once, once it's done, I will once again run the configure ambassador command to inject the configuration. At this point, you can see like it's not that the performance is not moving because I don't have the extra resource yet. Now configure. And now, in a matter of seconds, we should see that graph go up. Yep, there we go. And so if I need to scale up and down, I can repeat that uh, each time it's necessary. What I would like to emphasize here is that in a couple of minutes, I was able to um, build an application put it in uh, this registry, this uh, library of container images, then to scale it on multiple machines, and then to change the scaling parameters so I can scale up and down in just minutes each time. And the, the scripts that I have executed here are extremely simple. Um, like the build pack push script that I've used is uh, 70 lines of code. Uh, the uh, link to ambassadors script is 62, 62 lines of code. Uh, the create ambassador script, 60 lines of code again. And the configure ambassadors one, 69 lines of code again. So that's um, extremely, uh, extremely simple code that you can very easily uh, tailor to suit your needs. All right, so if you want more details about ambassadors and scaling, uh, we did an extremely in-depth presentation about that at the AWS reInvent conference uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the, it's the DVO317, that's the code name for the, the presentation. Uh, and it kind of covers uh, a lot of what we cover here, but with a strong emphasis on some of these implementation details. Um, uh, so. Thank you, that's all I have for today. I will now uh, answer questions. So this is a bunch of links that you will also be able to uh, access uh, in the slides that will be sent to you tomorrow. Um, the last thing I would like to mention before going to the Q&A uh, is that uh, in November, uh, there's going to be the Docker European Conference in Barcelona, uh, 16th and 17th in November. Uh, so if you have a strong interest into Docker containers, uh, you should obviously totally attend it. All right, and put up the slide with links, and I will look at the questions. So as a reminder, you have a questions thing uh, in the GoToWebinar panel where you can ask questions. Um, okay. Oh, <laughs> okay, there is a question not directly related to that. So. Um, I saw Jerome using the new Dell Experience 13, but whenever he does demos in webinars, he uses OS X. So what's going on with that? That's an extremely good question. Uh, I have, so the, my main computer is not the Dell Experience 13. It's a, a Lenovo ThinkPad. Uh, and I always carry two computers. Uh, my main computer is a Linux machine because I found it to be really the best environment to work with Docker. You can run containers directly. It's extremely fast. Uh, and I've been running Linux for um, almost two decades now, so it's really hard to go back. Uh, but very a lot of um, webinar and conferencing and other software uh, don't often work very well on Linux, so I have this extra Linux machine to, uh, uh, to, to sorry, this extra OS6 machine for, for those things. Uh, so that's the, the but the, my main uh, machine is my Linux computer. Next question, uh, can you use a combination of Docker Hub public and Docker Hub on-prem? Yes, absolutely. 
uh, you can, I mean, and, and generally people will do that because very often they will use the base library images that are available on the Docker Hub and then they will combine with some images on their on-prem registry. And it, you can even like build a private image that will be only on your private registry, uh, but using a base from the public uh, registry. So you can absolutely do that. How do we maintain control of all these Docker files, uh, compose images and everything? Um, if by control we mean source control, then we put them in, um, in source control precisely. Like all the examples I was giving there, I was doing git clone like in live to show that all the things that I'm running are really coming directly from public repos. So the Docker files will be checked into the code, the Docker compose file as well. The image, however, are big blocks of data, and so those will typically be stored into the registry. Even though if you're so inclined, you can export the Docker images and uh, uh, and, and store them as big blobs in another kind of registry, like FTP server, HTTP server, or whatever. Next question, with Swarm 1.0, is that already possible to deploy containers across hosts, or should Engine 1.9 be released first? So to deploy containers across hosts, here I'm, I'm showing the, the thing that already works, is available with the stable engine, and is using this ambassador concept. In the engine 1.9, which will be released very soon, uh, we will have uh, a networking plugin system that will allow communication between containers like directly without this ambassador concept. So for some workloads that makes things easier. For some other workloads it doesn't really simplify things because you still need like load balancing or failover and so you will still need that kind of extra ambassador but that, that will help a lot. And, but you can already deploy across multiple hosts because here I, I deploy this app across five hosts and so you can already do that without engine 1.9. Um, then where is Docker Swarm positioning itself compared to Kubernetes for multi-host service creation, launching of containers? Uh, well, it, it's very similar in the sense that in both cases it's all about uh, running um, containers on a cluster, scaling, uh, doing service discovery, doing load balancing. So the two technologies are similar. The key difference is the way that you interact with it. The key of Docker Swarm is uh, you talk to Swarm using the Docker API, while with Kubernetes you have different concepts, you have pods, you have application managers. So the, uh, the idea of Swarm is to be kind of easier to, uh, to, to start with. Um, and now uh, both approaches are not uh, incompatible because uh, you can totally uh, have Swarm in the front end and use Docker commands but Kubernetes in the back end to run the containers. Uh, will additional files to set ambassadors be always needed, or will this be made transparent in next version? Yeah, there will be a lot of extra transparency uh, with, as we said like a few minutes ago, with the new 1.9 engine version. So we will probably still need something specifically for database failover, something like that, uh, but um, all those things will be increasingly simple. Uh, next question, if we deploy a Docker image from the hub and then make sure it's, it's in a security issue discovered with it, how do we patch? Um, it's pretty much like with uh, other uh, mechanisms. It's like, okay, there is a security problem. First, uh, we need a fix, so we need an updated package, which in that case, we need an updated image on the Docker hub. And then if we are just using a plain image, like for this here, we just repull the image and we restart the container. Uh, if it's in a, uh, an image that we're building, then we need to rebuild. The, it, it's a fairly simple and straightforward process. You just rebuild, rerun, and, and that's it. Um, so once you have a full working environment deployed production, oh, so that's, that's pretty much the, the same question, like what if you receive a CVE uh, about the security flaw? So yeah, to re-emphasize that, um, the, 
uh, in, a, in another presentation, we have a slide about what do I do in case of security problem. And the short answer is you make sure that the upstream images are updated and then you repool them, you rebuild, you restart. And, and that's, that's it. That's all there is. you have to do. And that will a couple of other questions now. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, I hope this was uh, helpful and insightful. Uh, there are lots of other presentations and talks uh, about Docker, about microservices, about uh, deploying those things at scale. So if you have more questions or if some things are not completely clear, I hope that you can also kind of uh, uh, pick into those other presentations to uh, uh, fill in the gaps that we have uh, left here. Thanks a lot, everybody. And depending on your time zone, good morning, evening, afternoon, or night. Bye-bye.